Damn. It's been a while, right? Hello everyone, it's the number one ghetto goon here, and I'm back and finally talking about Jujutsu Kaisen again. Or more specifically, the cast room death paintings. Whoa! Slow down, Valor! Who the hell are the death paintings? Answering that question is exactly why I'm making this video. The cast room death paintings are special grade level threats to the Jujutsu world, but more than that, they are three brothers who share a bond like no other. So let's start with a bang and talk about the weirdest of the three, Esso. When talking about the death paintings, you'd be crazy not to remember Esso, mainly for his... Uh... Choice of clothing. But as he puts it, that's just because normal clothes are stuffy. Sure thing, buddy. But aside from that, he's also roughly in the middle in terms of overall strength. Esso was capable of pushing Nobara to her maximum travel speed casually, and forced Yuji to carry her the rest of the way, which is a feat by the way, considering Yuji at this point was a monster, but we will talk about that later as I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. When actually trying, Esso was capable of reacting to and blocking attacks from Yuji, which on their own were capable of damaging souls and beating the ever-loving shit out of Hanami. Esso was so incredible in fact, that he's even implied to have reacted to the Black Flash from Yuji. Although... Well... Yeah... That happened. People seem to get this odd idea that because Esso was only around for a few chapters, he was somehow weak, despite him and his brothers being confirmed special grade level threats, and that's just off raw curse energy. So let's talk about the other thing that makes Esso crazy strong, and that's what is known as Winged King and Rot. So starting with Winged King, Esso is essentially able to blast his blood at high speeds towards a target, and this blood is shown to be similar to a kind of acid. Okay, on its own, you might be thinking, is, is that it? Really? But it's the second part of his technique, Rot, that really powers it up. Rot has some prerequisites to activate that are almost non-existent for Esso, and these requirements are simply that their blood must have touched you in order for Rot to activate. I say touched because it's made apparent that if the blood can just touch one of your membranes, then Rot is ready to go, and membranes are contained in things like your skin cells, so all the blood has to do is touch your skin and you're already infected by it. But enough procrastinating, what does Rot actually do? Well, Rot is an intense pain that's so potent it almost completely paralyzes you and will rapidly kill you. You're forced to watch as your body slowly dissolves until, as Esso puts it, by morning you'll just be a pile of bones. But power isn't everything. Esso deeply cares about his brother's Choso and Kechizu, and a wave of sadness washes over Esso when he realizes Kechizu has been killed. Salt is thrown in the wound when previously Esso had actually said that he didn't really want to fight, he just came for the finger. Esso's brother was taken from him in a fight he didn't want to fight, and Esso does a good job of concealing this pain he's feeling, and he runs away and tries to get help to take revenge because to him, his family is everything. Unfortunately for him, Yuji has his own ideals and kills Esso, which ties into Kechizu, who was killed by Nobara. And if you thought Esso was downplayed, man, everyone, and I mean everyone, thinks Kechizu is a booty cheeks. But this isn't true at all. Multiple times, Kechizu actually showed the ability to react to Yuji and even outspeed Megami despite being right next to him. And for reference, this is a stronger Megami than the one that was able to react to Hanami and the same Megami who could swap hands with the second cursed womb. And a far stronger Megami than the one who could take some attacks from a holding back Sukuna. Am I saying Kechizu scales to Sukuna? Maybe, maybe not. But it's interesting to think about nonetheless, don't you think? But more interesting than that is the synergy Kechizu shares with his brother Esso. Both being able to trigger Rot off their bl blood attacks. Ketsuzu in this case, coming as a spray of blood from his mouth. Both Esso and Ketsuzu are shown to care for each other, with Ketsuzu being more of an innocent child type younger brother personality, and Esso being the more older brother K 
caring type, but as I mentioned prior, Nabara holds no sympathy for the devil, and kills Kechizu there and then with hairpin. This loss of both brothers was devastating for Choso, whose look of disinterest when he receives the news is contrasted heavily by his shattering of the game piece and his later outburst of anger upon hearing from Yuji about them shedding tears. But Choso is the oddball of the brothers, the anomaly you could say. Choso does not use rot, but instead operates incredibly similar to the sorcerer Noritoshi Kamo. Choso still manipulates his blood, and in that way, he is similar to his brothers, but he uses it in a different way. Choso is by far the strongest of the three brothers, and also possesses the most variety in terms of attacks. Possessing convergence, Choso is able to conjure his blood and manipulate it to perform attacks like supernova at a destination of his choosing. Supernova itself is like a shotgun, in the sense that it fires out in a widespread, like a buckshot as they put it. His more notable attack is the piercing blood, which is renowned to be able to reach the speed of sound. This attack was almost responsible for outright killing Yuji there and then in their confrontation, and was strong enough to cause severe damage even when blocked. Choso can then stay, take it a step further and enhance his body with the flowing red scale. Forming a pattern on Choso's face, his speed and power ascend to become a whole new level and is capable of slamming Yuji's skull into a wall, both metaphorically and literally. And then, Choso can simply stack this ability on top of itself to gain another level of power. Choso's arsenal is incredibly extensive with how his blood manipulation works. Sharp sword-like blood weapons are no problem for him, and if things come push to shove, he can harden his blood and turn it into an armor-like substance. It is this arsenal that allowed him to defeat the incredibly powerful Yuji and almost end his life there and then, only being stopped by Yuji's hidden power. The three death paintings are incredibly powerful. However, it is only really Choso who is actually acknowledged for this, despite his brothers also being incredibly powerful. Powerful enough to where the argument can be made that they are stronger than the disaster curse Hanami, and perhaps able to defeat the entire Kyoto exchange event single-handedly Toto included. And remember when I said Yuji was a monster earlier? Yeah, that's a stronger Yuji than the one who put Hanami in a headlock and surpassed Megami. Who on his own could use domain expansion and one shot a special grade curse, Megami that is. So when Esso and Ketchizu are able to react to this Yuji and even block some of his attacks, you are wired out how powerful these guys actually are. These three death paintings are not just curses. They are living beings that hold family above all else, and live for each other. So when both of his brothers are ripped from Choso, it creates this believable justification for his immense bloodlust towards Yuji Itadori, and allows us to almost sympathize with the quote-unquote villains of the story. And that brings me to the video title, Why the Death Paintings Are Underrated. Having explained the power of each of these brothers, and how close their bond is, which perpetuates a strong, familial narrative. I just don't see why they're shoved to the side when there is so much to explore with these characters and the effect that they have on the wider story. Akatami loves to hide things between the lines of the Jujutsu Kaisen, and just a little deeper look into some characters reveals a vast ocean of depth that really makes JJK a great manga and anime. The death paintings are underrated because their scaling is almost hidden in a sense, and their narratives are not as pronounced dominantly as someone like Yuji's but this shouldn't mean we should brush them aside when they're such great characters. Thanks for watching everyone. I thought I had to drop a video about how little the death paintings are actually talked about. They are really strong and pretty decent story to them despite not actually being around for that long, only like what like uh, 11 chapters total I think? Yes, I am finally back after the five or so months that I've been gone, but I will make sure to make up for it. I promise. So stick around for the next video, which is probably gonna be on One Piece? Or explaining the see-through world from Demon Slayer. I'll let you guys decide. Make sure to check out my friend Darkstar. He's making a new Marvel video. He's like got some great content. So make sure to give him some love. He's kind of like underrated right now. So, go, you know, go, give him, go pay him a visit. I will see you all later. And remember, stay cursed. <laughs> Hmm.